Hi, my name is Ramlo Pasquale. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Nuesis and the organizer of the DevOps Meetup in Turin, Italy. Welcome to the Open Source Summit Europe 2020. This session is about introduction to container and orchestrator. Here you have my details, my Twitter account, in case you want to reach me to discuss anything about container, Docker, Kubernetes, DevOps culture and practices in general. This session is about an introduction to container technologies and orchestrator, Docker and Kubernetes, in order to try to explain the basic concepts that can drive you through further studies, further analysis and exercise in order to practice on these technologies. Let's start with the container. There are different definition to define a software container. Container is a standard unit of software to package up code and its dependency. It's uh, an operating system layer virtualization. Uh, we'll see after in a slide how the container technology compare with virtualization of virtual machine as we used to run it since uh, decades now. The container at the end is a group of processes. In this uh, image you see in the slide, you can see that the container does contain a set of processes, but that if we go and analyze the processes into the operating system, we see exactly the same process that are inside the container directly from the operating system. It's a group of processes, one or multiple processes restricted to a private namespace. Namespace and C groups are uh, features available in the Linux kernel that allow to isolate a group of processes in order for them to see only a subset of the resources of the machine. This is what make a clear distinction between virtual machine and container. Virtual machine are based on hypervisors that operate a virtualization of the hardware. You have an hardware machine, so a server, a physical server with an hypervisor installed this hypervisor will let the virtual machines to see virtualized hardware inside the physical one to segregate and distribute the physical resources into a group of virtual resources where each virtual machine run with its own operating system and its own complete setup in terms of libraries, applications, and services. When it comes to container, as we said before, container can be seen as an uh, operating system virtualization instead of an hardware virtualization. It means that you have one host, physical or virtual, in most cases running on public cloud services, what you are using are already virtual machine and not physical machine, where on top of the operating system, an engine as the Docker engine, only you to virtualize spaces inside the operating system to independent application. It means that shared libraries are not duplicated, but are used by each of the container uh, using the same uh, source. But at the same time, if you need to isolate a specific version of a library inside a container, this will run without conflicting with the other libraries installed on and available in other container because they are uh, isolated each other using the namespace and C group technology we mentioned before. Does container mean Docker? This is a question that uh, we got uh, in uh, different cases talking with people that were starting addressing this uh, technology. Docker is by far the most known container technology, but it's not the only one. Rocket, RunC, but also LXD, LXC, or Hyper-V container in the Windows, Windows uh, area are different technology of running container inside an operating system. Okay, we have containers, but we say this session is about an introduction about containers and orchestrators. So why orchestrator on top of container? A container, I can isolate my application, create a package that is easy to deploy, easy to distribute. You can run it, be sure that you will always get the same uh, set of libraries. You will not have conflicts in terms of configuration, in terms of uh, version of the software. But when you start running multiple container on a high number of container, not two, three container or machine, but you have hundreds of container that are active and you have them running on 
a different number of virtual machines that can be start and stop and restarted. Without an orchestrator, you can find yourself a bit in trouble in trying to balance which container need to run on which machine and which container need to restart, which needs to be left uh, uh, stopped in case of issue with container you need to scale horizontally. What does an orchestrator do? The orchestrator does look at the status of the container into the different machines that are uh, considering the cluster that the orchestrator is managed. And following the rules that you gave it in terms of the configuration, the desired configuration that you want, the orchestrator will take the ownership about stopping, starting, moving containers between the different available nodes in order to assure that you always have the specific number and kind of container that you want to be up and running, up and running independently from the state of the individual nodes. As we said before, for container and Docker, the same question can when it comes from orchestrator and Kubernetes. Does orchestrator mean Kubernetes? Not necessary. Kubernetes is, again, the most known between the orchestrator, but it's not the only one. Docker has Docker's one technology. You have Nomad and uh, Mesosphere as other alternative, but you also have a uh, specific proprietary alternative available in the different cloud provider that uh, uh, can orchestrate or uh, container running on their platform as a service. So why Docker and Kubernetes are the ones that are mentioned before and why are the ones that we are referring to in this specific session? As the US's, but also other companies made the same kind of consideration, we selected Docker and Kubernetes as our reference when it comes to container and orchestration because they are the solution with the large community. They are fully supported by all major cloud provider. They are fully supported also for on-premise configuration they have part of the Open Container Initiative, part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. The Docker support Kubernetes, if you install the Enterprise Edition, it does have Kubernetes inside. And Docker is even supporting a migration from his own orchestrators, one to Kubernetes and Gorg, uh, Borg, uh, the Google Borg is the foundation of Kubernetes, making this having an history that is longer than the history of the Kubernetes name itself. Let's get the basic of the container. So how a uh, container is created and which are the different naming that we should use. We are, I was using, I'm using a lot this term container that is the running instance of an image, but what you basically have to run a container is the image. The image is the immutable package of the application in this dependency. It is composed by multiple layer because you can reuse the same layer in different images without having to uh, duplicate it uh, if it's exactly the same uh, subset of uh, uh, libraries and code. And uh, is created through a Docker file that is basically the set of instruction that are used by the Docker daemon to build images and save them. The, these images can be then distributed through registry so it's a repository repository of images that can be uh, pulled to a system in order to make them in execution. The image is the mutable package. The container is the running instance. The running instance is not immutable per se. You can enter into a container and you can make changes inside a running container as you can do when you connect to an operating system. But the container, does inherit from the image. It means that if the container is stopped and you start a new container, it will not have the changes you made in the running container that you were connected before. It will start again exactly from the same image. And it will start from the image as it was packaged and with all the content in terms of configuration, in terms of uh, code and libraries that were in its immutable package. If you have to change the image, you don't change that image, but you create a new one with the changes that you want to apply. A Docker file is a set of instruction. It's a set of instruction to build a, a container image that uh, go in sequence and allow you to define which action in terms of installation, configuration, copy of file, you to inside the image. You can copy files from your file system to machine where the build of the image is running, or you can copy file between uh, 
uh, images. You also create your own image starting from an existing image. This allows you to create a multi-stage build that all you do to optimize the image creation process and the image size as, for example, moving your step into an image that does include SDK to build the application inside the container and testing tool in order to validate what you built, but then keeping the built solution once the test has passed and copy it to another image where the SDK and the testing tool are no longer available in order to have the image as small and uh, fast as possible to run. Let's move forward from the image container uh, to the orchestrator and Kubernetes. The origin of Kubernetes, the Kubernetes, Kubernetes, the term is a Greek term uh, said from Altsman, is the orchestrator for container, builds on Docker container, but it also supports other container technology. It can run on any cloud provider or on bare metal, even on virtual machine, is in part by the Google experience is 100% an open source project written in Go and has been created by three Google employees during 2014. It's been released version 1.0 in 2015. We are currently running version uh, 1.9 as the uh, latest uh, production ready version. You see K8S as a name that is usually uh, used to shorten the name Kubernetes. Is just K, S, and the number of letters in the middle that is eight. It started with the Google experience of problem of managing the size and the scale of their own solution. And it started with the idea of the data center as a computer. Uh, what does it mean that the center is a computer? It means that you have to extract completely from the hardware. So move to a software defined at the center. You have to extract from the network. So you move to a software defined network and you have to implement a declarative application deployment. So the deploy itself is the communication of the deploy. And you have to put in place a system that has self healing uh, functionality and auto scaling functionality in order to reduce the amount of operation and support you need to have to keep your application up and running when your scale becomes something that is unmanageable by manual uh, operation or reactive uh, operation uh, done by a support team. Kubernetes has been designed to be a multi-project. So initially it was set in the presentation the term multi-tenant. That is not really correct. Kubernetes is not perfectly suited for multi-tenant in terms of multi-owner of the same cluster. Uh, there are projects that are enhancing the functionality in order to make this a bit more strict and secure in terms of managing a multi-tenant, but it's definitely designed for multi-project, meaning a single owner of the cluster, but a cluster that is shared between different projects, each having its own subset of resources. And it has been designed for integration with an API-first approach that make this uh, the solution that has been extended most also with the, all the integration with all the different public cloud providers. Taking this image from a blog and uh, VMware website is comparing vSphere and Kubernetes. So again, we're comparing virtual machine with uh, our subject, in this case, the orchestrator part. And the, as for the virtual machine uh, cluster vSphere for VMware, you have a controller that uh, is designed in order to keep track of the status of the cluster itself. The VS center server in the, in the case of Visper, Kubernetes master nodes in the case of Kubernetes. Then you have your resources that are available to run your application. In the case of vSphere, these are the different hosts running the hypervisor. In case of Kubernetes, these are the different worker nodes that run the kubelet application. In vSphere, you can define different resource pools. So you segregate your resources across the entire cluster in order to assign them to group or virtual machine. In Kubernetes, you can do the same kind of segregation through the namespace concept where you can assign limits in terms of and quotas in terms of resources that can be used. And then you deploy your application, your container inside this namespace. The vSphere solution take care about integrating all external resources as storage network 
The same thing is done by Kubernetes in order to integrate those resources and make them visible for the application inside and uh, making them, them usable without having to deal with them uh, directly. If we go more deep and you, we go directly to the virtual machine uh, concept that it is as the base, the unit of work when it comes to vSphere in this case, on the other side in Kubernetes, we talk about pods. Pods are the unit of works that you have to consider inside Kubernetes. We were talking about container before. When we talk about Kubernetes, you will hear the term pods more than container. Pods is the equivalent in a certain way of what a virtual machine is in a virtualization environment as vSphere for VMware. A virtual machine does include its own operating system and then his application inside it, and he has its own IP to connect to the network of the other virtual machine. A pod is the environment where the container are activated. Every pod does generate an IP internal to the cluster, and this IP, as well as the volumes, are shared between all the containers that are running inside a pod. You can have a pod that run a single container, as in this example, the MongoDB container in blue on the right, but you can also have a pod that run multiple containers. This can be because you have two applications that run side by side. You have different patterns that can be used. You can have an init container that executes some operation in order to facilitate and the startup of your application that run the container executing, for example, certain check or configuration. You can have a sidecar container, so a container that runs side by side with your application container in order to do some service as log collection or managing uh, connectivity. And uh, uh, you can have multiple containers running together because they need to share the same resources in terms of volume and uh, IPs. The architecture of Kubernetes is based on this specific important layer about resource management, scheduling, and service management. The scheduler is, in particular, one of the strengths of the Kubernetes solution for its ability to distribute the different resources available, execute the different application, the different pods, in base the decision on the resource required by each pod and the resource available and the status, etc. Underlying layer are the infrastructure, the, the hardware in the operating system where the Kubernetes is then installed and the container runtime that need to exist on the machine where Kubernetes is running that Kubernetes will interact with in order to start and run container images into actual container instances. As a main concept of the architecture, you have the different nodes composing a cluster. You have the Kubernetes control plane, so the master node, and you have the Kubernetes nodes or the worker node where the application is actually executed. The control plane is composed by the ATCD uh, database, the, uh, it's a key value store, that is basically the database that Kubernetes used to store the status of, of the required configuration and the status of the uh, system in any moment. The API server is the core of all the interaction between the different components of Kubernetes. The scheduler take care about scheduling the different uh, execution of the different deployments that are required. The controller manager and the cloud controller manager take care about interaction with the other uh, internal or external services. In the worker node, you have the container runtime, typical Docker, but it can be Rocket or Run C. And you have the kubelet that is the service that communicate between the master components to authenticate to the cluster, to receive the commands, and uh, uh, communicate with the container runtime in order to establish the running status and configuration of the different pods. The kube proxy operate as abstraction of the network in order to all the different application running inside a Kubernetes cluster distributed across multiple nodes to communicate each other 
without having to know which is the actual network topology of the machine where Kubernetes is running. Some of the basic concepts, uh, we already mentioned some of those uh, terms. I'll try to go quick as possible on this slide. It's a quite long deck uh, that will be uh, made available. You can also check uh, on my different account other uh, presentation related to this uh, uh, subject that has been uh, made. And you can find easily on the internet a lot of documentation, in particular Kubernetes website itself, as a very, very clear and extensive documentation of all the terminology and all the different uh, operation. The cluster is the collection of the OS that aggregates the available resources, so CPU, disk, uh, memory, network connectivity. In the cluster, you have two different kinds of nodes that we mentioned before, the master nodes and the node or worker node. The master nodes represent a collection of components that make the control plane of Kubernetes. So these are responsible for the cluster decision in order to schedule the new execution to accept new deployment and new definition. The node, worker node, are the different hosts, physical or virtual, where the kubelet interact with the container runtime in order to execute the different uh, pods and so the different container inside the pods. Namespace is the logical uh, segmentation inside the cluster that all to segregate and uh, create a specific scope of run for each deployment and set of uh, uh, pods and services. Label is a key element inside the Kubernetes world. So you can label object with the key value pairs that allow you to describe and group together different objects, different deployment pod services. Labels can be uh, used and are actually used in order to operate selection with the selector that allow to find which group of objects are subjected to a certain action, not on the base of the name of the object, but on the base of the labeling of the object. Annotation are also key value pair, but in this case, they are not used by Kubernetes itself in order to operate selection and uh, define the target of operation, but are used by operators running on Kubernetes that will read this annotation in order to be instructed to do certain uh, activity. For example, annotation are used in order to instruct the certification manager, the CERT manager, to uh, create a new certificate request for uh, a website, uh, a service serving a website, for example, that you deploy inside Kubernetes. This is not done by Kubernetes itself, but is a way that Kubernetes allow an application running inside of Kubernetes to read information and react to that. The pod, as we say before, is a smaller unit of work uh, and management. So is the resource in terms of IP, one internal IP uh, volumes, and then resources for in terms of CPU and memory that are associated in order to run one or multiple uh, container. Replication controller, replica set, deployment, stateful set, daemon set are all kind of deployment of pods. So uh, method, different methods in order to declare one or multiple instances of a pod that can be replicated and distributed in, uh, in the cluster. In particular, we have to consider the difference between a daemon set. With a daemon set, you are telling to Kubernetes that you want one instance of that pod that you declare in daemon set running and active in each of the nodes of the cluster. So if you have a new node, a new instance of that pod will be executed on that node. A stateful set is a way that has been identified in order to run stateful application in Kubernetes. Kubernetes has been used and is naturally designed for stateless application, but with a stateful set, you can define that you want your pod to be executed with a specific naming that is a, a incremental a numeric value of the pod. You want your pod to be started and stopped at always in a specific order in order to maintain and include a certain uh, state and identity. While the deployment is a declarative method in order to manage stateless pods, 
in a replica set. So you define how many instances or for which rule with using auto scaling rule you want your pods to be created and you can define which kind of deployment approach you want to have in terms of replacement or rolling upgrade of uh, uh, your instance. But your pod in this case are completely stateless. So their naming is uh, a variable, the order on where the pods are stopped and start is not uh, uh, predefined. Services, ingress controller and ingress, we have a specific slide about that. The service is the method to expose pods selected through a label in order to receive connection from inside or outside the cluster. The ingress controller is one of the more used uh, methods in order to expose services in HTTP or HTTPS uh, to the outside world without having to expose each service individually, opening the port externally for each service externally to the cluster individually. With the ingress controller, practically, you have a reverse proxy inside the cluster that operate as a, a central point to receive the connection from external and distribute it to the services. An ingress controller can be based on Nginx, or it can be a uh, uh, traffic or HA proxy. There are different uh, uh, technology available. In all cases, it operates as a reverse proxies and uh, load balancer router that route the request internal to the cluster. It is configured through a resource that is called ingress. Uh, this is a common uh, misunderstanding of difficulties, uh, confusing the terminology between the ingress controller and the ingress. So the ingress controller is the actual deployment that run as a reverse proxy, con managing the, connect the connectivity from the external world to your services, while the ingress is a definition of rules to configure automatically the ingress controller for your own application. You can have only one ingress controller for each class, so one Nginx ingress controller or one traffic ingress controller, but you can have both uh, ingress controller in the same cluster if you want. And you will have as many ingress definition or ingress rule as many deployment you want the ingress controller to be used for. Coming to storage, uh, volume is the storage that is tied to a pod life cycle, so it's consumable by one or more container inside the pod. A persistent volume represents a storage resource that is defined inside uh, the cluster and that can be claimed by uh, a pod through a persistent volume claim in order to attach a volume to the pod. This is done in order to hold or to provision, pre-provision, uh, storage and reuse storage or to create storage resources that can survive to the uh, unavailability of a pod in order to be reattached to the pod when it starts again, as for example, contain the uh, database file that needs to be uh, used in the case of a destruction or, and recreation of the database pod. A storage class are an abstraction on top of the storage resources in order to define the provisioner and the attribute on how certain uh, storage can be uh, provisioned inside the cluster uh, dynamically. Config map is uh, a way to manage configuration externally from the uh, pod itself. A config map uh, can be uh, referenced through a command line argument. It can be use as an environment variable or it can be injected into uh, the, the pod as a volume, as a file or a, as a folder. This can contain a file, for example, a configuration file that you uh, connect. A classical example, you have your pod containing an Nginx container. The Nginx configuration is an nginx.conf file. And this file, instead of existing inside the pod, is defined inside a config map that is a separate object inside the cluster and can be deployed and updated separately from the pod and can be one deployment that then is used by multiple instances of the pod. And then inside the pod, you mount that config map as the Nginx conf file. So the Nginx application, when it starts, it will find the file and will use it as it is an internal uh, file into the container itself. A secret is very similar to a config map, but it's storing code at base64 uh, uh, 
content. It can be encrypted. The rest of configured is depend on your uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, deployment and the feature set that you have configured and also third parties uh, application that you can integrate. Inside Kubernetes, you can define uh, roles in order to define which user or service account uh, can do which operation. You define roles or cluster role, which is the difference. The difference is that the role exists inside the namespace. A cluster role in, exists across all namespace in the same cluster. The syntax is the same. So you define which API uh, that role can connect to and which verb are allowed for the role on the specific API. With a role binding or a cluster role binding, if it's cross namespace, you will then assign the role to a specific user or service account. The service account is the identity that the pod or external services can use to interact with the cluster uh, directly. You can also define pod security policies, so define a set of conditions that the pod must uh, be compliant to in order to be executed inside the cluster. Two keywords are particularly important when it comes to uh, adoption of Kubernetes. These two keywords are immutable and ephemeral. It looks to be conflicting between the two, but it's important in order to use Kubernetes correctly to understand um, the key uh, value of these two words. Immutable, because we are running images, container images that become then active container instance inside the port, but they run inside port that are ephemeral. What it means, it means that Kubernetes scheduler in considering the state of the cluster in terms of the resources that are used and consumed by the different pod and the resources that are available on the different nodes that compose the cluster, the scheduler can define if to stop and evict a specific pod and restart it maybe on another node because the, res the resources in terms of CPU, for example, that were available in that node were no longer sufficient in order to run the specific pod in that node. So that pod had to be moved to another node. This makes these two concepts to be something that is important to consider together when you run Kubernetes. You have to consider when you run Kubernetes that your application is ephemeral. Your application will, in a certain moment, be stopped and restart automatically for some reason, for a crash or for the need of move between nodes for a maintenance or for resource, consum resource consumption done by another application, the cluster itself can decide to stop and restart your pod. So your pod, you should not consider that as something that is permanent. It's not a machine that is permanent. But when it restarts, it restarts creating a new Docker, a new Docker or uh, RunC or uh, Rocket container image. Uh, or better, it run in a new container instance that start from a container image. It means that if you enter into a pod and you make any modification inside the pod, this modification will be lost in the moment the pod is destroyed and restarted in another uh, node or even in the same node because it will start again exactly from its own image. Usage of the namespace. I said before, namespace are uh, mean to segregate logically resources inside the cluster. A namespace itself, by default, does not have any kind of, kind of limitation. Uh, there are some uh, uh, mechanisms inside the namespace. So for example, you cannot asset, uh, uh, make accessible a secret that is in the namespace from an application that is on another namespace. But there is, by default, no limitation in terms of resources that are available for any application that run in one namespace compared to another one. But it's possible to add attributes to the namespace. You can uh, create on the namespace rules in terms of quotas for the resources. So your namespace cannot have more than a certain number of pods running or cannot have more than a certain CPU consumption or memory consumption. You can also create network policies so you can define which application, which network connection are allowed or not inside the namespace and cross the different namespace. And you can define which are some uh, defaults that the deployment executed in the namespace will have to complain with or will be imposed in terms 
of uh, uh, resource uh, allocation. Uh, the permission also, as I said before, are namespaced. So you have roles that are defined inside a namespace. This allows you, for example, to create in the same cluster namespace for staging and namespace for production, where you limit the number of resources for CPU and memory that the staging namespace can use in order to have uh, uh, more safeness on the production uh, availability. Or you can also have different roles so that you have uh, uh, a certain group of operator or developer that can operate certain activity in the staging land space, but they cannot do other activity in uh, the same activity in the production one. Or you can have different project team that each running in his own namespace with uh, being able to create and destroy resources, but only inside his own namespace without having the ability to even see the list of resources on the other uh, namespace. Networking. Uh, container in a pod, they exist in the same uh, network, so they can talk on localhost one uh, each other. And the pod is where the IP inside the cluster is assigned. Each pod is given a unique IP inside the cluster for its own life cycle, and they can talk uh, uh, each other through this IP. The services also are given a persistent cluster, unique IP that. Uh, is something that persists uh, to the uh, pod that are in the back end of the service, the one that are selected through the selector of uh, configuring the service and the label on the pod. And uh, there is also an automatic DNS name resolution that is assigned. This all log your application to refer for the connectivity to services. And this will all log to connect to the active pods that are available without the need to know which are the pod in which node they run, uh, which IP those pod have been assigned. The external connectivity uh, can be uh, managed through services that expose through a port on the public IP of the cluster the service. And the ingress controller and uh, uh, ingress rule can be used to centralize uh, and minimize the number of uh, uh, external connection that uh, and the port external exposed ports that you have in your cluster. Integration are available in the different cloud provider, but also promise with uh, different vendors in order to automate the configuration of load balancer services in the moment you define a service of a load balancer kind inside the cluster. The service, as I said before, is done to expose a set of pods. It can expose them internally to the cluster, or it can expose externally, for example, in the diagram here, through a load balancer that go through a specific port that is uh, mapped to a service in the external interface of the nodes of the cluster. When you expose a service directly, you are exposing uh, directly the uh, connection to the pods that are selected by the service. But uh, if you need then other services uh, and other deployment to be exposed this way, you will have to create a new service that has a different port to expose it externally and a different load balancer configuration. In order to simplify this configuration, the ingress controller has been introduced. The ingress controller has its own service and is exposed. And it exposes HTTP and HTTPS by, by default, but can be different configuration to all also UDP and not TCP uh, connection or to have a different ports. But as a standard, it is used for HTTP and HTTPS. It acts as a reverse proxy, and then it will route the request to the different services internally to the cluster without the need to expose each service externally. It can also act uh, in order to get uh, SSL TLS offload, so you have an HTTPS terminated to the ingress controller, and then from the ingress controller to the service, it will go in HTTP. And it can also have different routing rules in order to route requests to different services on the path, of, uh, not only on the host name, but also in the base of the path. And you can configure different rules as course, a header, or authentication IP filtering uh, uh, in order to be managed all this at the ingress controller layer. Application deployment. The applications can be done, as we said before, in different ways. Deployment, stateful set, daemon set, we said already before, there are the job or cron job. These are really similar to a batch that is executed once, or a cron job is something that is executed regularly on a certain uh, uh, schedule. 
when you make a deployment, you define the number of replicas. So how many instances you want of a specific application to be up and running on your cluster. You define the revision history limit. So how many previous version you want to have uh, maintained in order to be able to operate a rollback to a specific version. And you can also define your strategy for the deployment, for the update uh, that can be a uh, replace or recreate. So you want, in the moment you execute, do deploy a new version to destroy the previous version and replace with a new one, because maybe there is uh, no compatibility to have the two different version running at the same time. Or you can have a rolling update uh, that makes something more gradual. So new resources are created with a new version side by side with the old one, and only when the readiness check or the liveness check of those resources is uh, correct. So the cluster know that the new deployment is working, it will start destroying the old one. In order to do this, this check, this is done through props. Props can be done through an exact action, so executing a specific command inside the container, a TCP socket connection, or an HTTP uh, operation, so a GET operation through a, a HTTP path in order to check the response code. Uh, and this can be done to three different kinds of probes. The startup probes, so indicate to Kubernetes when the application is uh, completed, the startup operation. So it is it can be useful if your application is uh, as a long uh, term uh, to, to before being uh, completed in the start. The readiness probe tell to the cluster if the container is ready to accept connection through the service. So if the readiness probe is failing, the pod is still there, is still existing, but the service will no longer route requests to it. The liveness probe instead is a task to tell to the cluster if the container is correctly running and if the liveness probe will fail, the kubelet will kill the container and have it restart to resolve the uh, uh, non-working status. In your deployment, you also define your resource that you are requesting and the limits you want to set to your resources. Again, these as the probes are not mandatory, but all these configuration are really important in order to instruct correctly the scheduler to take his own decision. What is important when we talk about resources is also to know some of the rules the scheduler are using in order to define when to evict, when to delete or destroy an active pod when the node where the pod is running is going low on resources. One of the rules is the difference between the requested resource and the actually used resource. So if I don't declare any resource usage, so for example, I don't declare memory uh, request, it means that my request is zero. So if I have my application that has no request and is using 200 meg of memory, but I have another pod that uh, is a request of 500 meg and is using 600 meg. For that one, the difference between 600 and 500 is 100. While for my other pod, the difference between 200 and zero is 200. So my pod with no request is the one that we selected first for the eviction, considering the specific rule. So it's very important during the development phase to do testing of your application, define which are the uh, resource requested for required to run the application, set this explicitly. Limits are then set in order to avoid your application to consume more than a certain amount of resources in order to save resources for the, the other uh, application that run on the same cluster. Tains and toleration are metadata that can be assigned to nodes and can be assigned to the pods in order to instruct your scheduler on how and where to execute a specific uh, uh, pod containing a specific application. You can be willing not to execute your pod in a specific node that you want your pod to be executed on a different node, for example, because you have an application that requires Z GPU capability and you want that application to be run on a node that has GPU installed and not on a node that is not running that kind of hardware, physical or virtual. You can also set selector and affinity in order to try to drive the scheduler out to schedule your pod, uh, for example, because 
you want to be sure that uh, two different pods running to a kind of container, for example, the application and uh, database, you want them to run on the same node. Or on the other side, if you want two applications, you want to be sure that they will not run on the same node uh, at the same time. You can uh, try to instruct the scheduler configuring all these different rules. Uh, just a note, pay attention to this. It's always a bit complex. You have to be uh, very consistent when you label or the resources when you want to make uh, use of this advanced feature. Uh, you have also to check the amount of rules and pods that you have in order not to uh, create an excessive load on the scheduler in order to define the kind of uh, uh, activity and the placement of the different resources, even if uh, uh, the impact is only when you are uh, talking about deployment with several hundreds of nodes. We have been talking about deployments of the application inside Kubernetes and all the different uh, attributes that you have to set to the deployment. But when it comes to the deployment, how to actually deploy your application into Kubernetes? There are different uh, ways of doing that. Uh, there are different tools. KubeCTL, Customize Helm are uh, between the most uh, uh, common one that we will uh, see in this uh, slide. But first of all, we need to have a, a little uh, clarification about two important terms, imperative versus declarative. You can operate, interact with Kubernetes with both patterns. You can use kube CTL, kube control as an imperative uh, way of doing so. You can execute a command as a run to make a, a pod to be created or deployment to be created. Uh, or as a kubes CTL create uh, action or scale to change uh, the, the horizontal scaling of a deployment, for example. Or you can use a declarative uh, way of working. So you will use your JSON or YAML file where you will describe your desired state and you will give it to the Kube City, Kube, uh, Kubernetes API delegating to Kubernetes to take all the kind of action that are required in order to match the desired state. And then you can do an update by submitting a new version of your declaration in order to uh, ask the cluster to change the state to your new desired state. But while we're talking about CI/CD, when we talk about Kubernetes, as uh, we see here, Kelsey Hightower, it's quite important thing when we talk about Kubernetes, say Kubernetes is a platform for building platform. It's not the end game. The end game is the place to start. When we talk about the deployment inside Kubernetes, we're not talking about an application. When we talk about a deployment, we have something similar to this schema. So we have the actual deployment object that contains pod, but it also contains uh, config map and secret that can be used by your pod. The deployment itself is happening inside the namespace where you could have set limits or quota of different policies that you need on the namespace. And these attributes can be different depending on the application that uh, you are going to deliver or depending on the environment where your application has to be delivered. You have done the service and the ingress definition in your deployment, but this imply the existence of, for example, of an ingress controller and external services as the public DNS or the load balancer that your service or your ingress controller have to interact with. The cert manager can be something that is related to the way you're using the secret, for example, to provision TLS certificates. And in this case, it's also linked to your ingress definition. And you have your storage and volume that you want to the, to the pub, to the different pods that depends on the storage class that have been defined in your cluster. And the storage provided that are external that are the condition that you need to have in order to understand which kind of storage class you can define. If you are on a certain cloud provider or you have an on-premises solution, you can have different storage provider available and others that are not available that you have to consider. You also have to consider that even if your application is one application, you can have different kind of needs in terms of deployment. We all know that the desire state is to have different environments that are absolutely equal 
uh, one to the other. But we also know that in real world, this is not usually the case. You have different needs and different situations when it goes to the development environment, the staging environment, the production environment. In production, you could have, for example, a dedicated registry to uh, store the production uh, images and you have maybe a multi-region setup and you have multiple replicas of the employment in order to guarantee the uptime and the scalability and the performance. Well, maybe in staging, you have a single namespace and you just have uh, uh, a different kind of storage or a different kind of sizing. And in development, you are referring to a different registry because you are also using unstable version of your images that are not published to the production registry. You can maybe have just one replica for deployment and you have a different uh, namespace. So maybe you have multiple namespace because you have feature branch and you have one namespace of development for each of the feature branch. So it, this means that your deployment definition and your deployment action is not exactly the same, not only between different application, but also for the same application, depending on where you're doing the deployment, you could be running different kind of deployment or have the need to have different attributes or different value to the same attribute, depending on uh, where you are deploying the same application. In terms of deployment tools, we have different uh, option, as I said before. One option, the starting one that we have to consider, is to have chipctl Cube Control Plan Manifest File in the form of JSON or YAML file. Uh, this is the official tool, it's the standard one you get when you start dealing with Kubernetes. There is no need to install any additional package. It is simple or the simpler one uh, between the solution that you have uh, in place. It's standard. You, uh, in any case, if you are dealing with Kubernetes, you will need to know how this tool works, how you can work in an imperative model or how you can work in a declarative model with kubectl and how you define the different uh, manifest file uh, for the different kind of resources and objects you can deploy in Kubernetes. This is something that is a uh, uh, must have in terms of your knowledge in the moment you are working with Kubernetes. So if you need to know that, uh, definitely you can manage your deployment with this. But it does not directly support variables. So you cannot really reuse in different kind of deployment for different application or for different environment of the same application, the same manifest file. What you can do, you create template and you clone this template and you make the changes one to the other, but that's become difficult to manage as soon as your number of application or environment is growing. Or you can put placeholder inside the file and use your CI CD pipeline uh, uh, to operate replacement of your placeholder with uh, uh, different values that are variable depending on the application and on uh, the different environment. And it does not manage dependency. Uh, there is a, a GitHub project uh, that uh, uh, I made available, and it's available in the comment of this slide, where there are some sample. When you execute uh, uh, kubectl apply on the file, you can apply a single file, you can apply a folder with all the files that are inside. These files will be applied in alphabetical order. Uh, it means that there is no check on dependency. And so if the order of the file is not the correct one in terms of the dependency, some of the, your apply command will just fail because of missing dependency. It's true that being a declarative uh, mechanism, if you apply it again, you can apply it as many times you want, it will be a item potent. Uh, so you will just get the uh, final state. It will not change things that you are not changing in terms of definition. And so you will recover from the missing dependency one after the other, but it's definitely not the way you want to manage uh, your deployment. You could do it by defining explicitly your order of execution, but again, in complex uh, deployment, it can be an additional effort to be uh, managed. In order to solve some of these problems, uh, customize the project that has been uh, started, evolved, and now part official of the Kubernetes tool. You don't need to install any additional package. You use customize through your kubectl command line. It does support variable patching and composition. It means that you can create snippets and fragments of a manifest file, and you can merge those manifest files uh, one to another. It means that you can have something that is reusable across different deployment, different application, or different environment, still managing the variation uh, between uh, between them. 
you can also use that to reuse common modules. So imagine a structure where you have your own uh, department taking care about the observability solution that you use in your uh, own uh, uh, application externally to the application. And your observability uh, solution, for example, is deployed inside Kubernetes, but in order to interact with each application to grab metrics and logs, it needs the deployment of the application to have specific annotation so that your observability tool will get from this annotation all the metadata that are required. This annotation could be created as a module that then is merged into any application deployment using the customized uh, application. It means that you don't have all the application team to know and to be aware and to remember to insert those annotations, but this will be iterated at runtime when the command is executed. And you can have a separate department that take care about only that specific module that is then injected inside your deployment. I made example with the annotation, but the same things can happen to different attributes as for example, setting the resource uh, request and limit is something that can be different between different environments. And you just ha have the same YAML file where you merge different uh, uh, models for uh, the different option. You still need to manage file and folder order. So customers does not have uh, the, the concept of dependency in the order as uh, we said before for KFCTL. Or you can, as we say before, manage this by constructing your pipeline to manage the order of execution in a correct way. A very popular way to manage deployment inside Kubernetes is Elm. Elm is not part of Kubernetes per se, it's an additional tool. You don't need to install a specific tool when it comes to version 3 of Elm. In the previous version, you had to install Tiller uh, uh, components inside the cluster in order to interact in the client server uh, communication, but with Elm, uh, version 3, this is no longer uh, needed. You execute through, again, a command line. What you have using an Elm chart is that you have a template uh, definition where you can set variable inside uh, what is exactly a, a, a Kubernetes uh, plane manifest. There's a plane manifest where inside the manifest you can put variable, you can put if condition in order to execute or not certain uh, part of your uh, deployment. It does not support composition. So it's not uh, as uh, customized, you cannot uh, compose your file. So in the case of the annotation that I was men uh, mentioning before, in this case with Elm, those annotation has to be inserted into the uh, template file, into the the manifest, but it does support dependencies. So it will check on the different object and will manage the dependency between the object. And it has a co concept of a package of the application. What you have on a noun chart is a template that is grouping together the different kind of resources that your deployment needs. So if your application is composed by a deployment object plus a service, a config map, a secret, and an ingress, and uh, uh, volume, uh, persistent volume, and persistent volume claim definition, you can package all together into an ARM chart. And every time you will execute, this will be executed together. You have your different placeholder and your if condition in order to define uh, different variables. So for example, in the same uh, manifest, you can have declare the image repository both your unstable re uh, registry and your stable images registry and have an if condition that on the base of the value that you pass on the execution, you will select which of the two to use without having to create two different deployment files. You will set your uh, value for the different variables into a file, the value file, or you can uh, give them on uh, the command line as a parameter in order to execute. Another option, uh, is to use Terraform and ACL language. So Terraform has two different uh, options. It can directly uh, deploy the resource to the Kubernetes provider. So Terraform interact with Kubernetes and execute the uh, deployment, or it can have an Elm provider, so it will deploy an Elm chart. So you have an Elm chart, but instead of deploying it directly through the Elm command line, you ask Terraform to deploy it for you. 
in case of usage of Terraform, you will use the same ACL syntax that you are using for other Terraform resources as uh, managing your public cloud uh, resources. You can manage dependency. A Terraform provider will manage dependencies for you, but then you have, as part of the ACL language, the option to declare your dependencies between different uh, different resources or the order of execution you can support variable because this is part of the acl uh, syntax and uh, capabilities and you can integrate your kubernetes deployment with your terraform workflow validate plan and apply and you can have to your uh, kubernetes deployment inside the terraform state together with the rest of the terraform deployment so for this reason this can be an option if you are proficient with acl you are using terraform on all the different provider you could consider also uh, this option this is the only option between the one that have presented where you are not dealing with the uh, kubernetes manifest syntax so is in any case something more that you have to learn uh, if you are not already proficient on acl so what do you use uh, other option besides I mentioned, these are say between the most uh, popular one. What should I use? It depends a lot. What is your content? What is your need? So if you have already a proficiency in ACL and you are using Terraform for everything, you could consider to use uh, Terraform as your deployment tool into Kubernetes. Considering it, in any case, you will have to learn the syntax and the format of the uh, kubectl plan manifest. If you want to package your application and you have self-contained team that manage an application in all its components, the Helm chart can be your uh, preferred solution. If your company structure is such that you have dedicated team to specific areas that work cross application as a security team working in security aspect cross all application, an observability team monitoring observability one, and you have a storage team uh, managing all uh, other aspects, then the customized version is the one that can uh, fit better your structure and organization. It also depends a lot on how much you are uh, already using the automated pipeline, uh, because if you're using the pipeline, your dependence in order uh, complexity can be managed at the pipeline level while if you are executing things uh, uh, from uh, um, via an operator from a computer, something that we would not suggest as the preferred way to operate, but some companies are doing that, and maybe there are also good reasons in certain circumstances to do that. Uh, the fact that to have something that does not manage the dependency directly can become an additional complexity uh, to manage there. Uh, what we would suggest is to start simple and gradually add complexity. What does it mean to start simple? First thing, you will need to learn the plain manifest and kubectl. You have to learn how to use kube control in an imperative and declarative way. This is in any case needed for your way to interact with a cluster. When this is done, you can start exploring customize and help first one or the other, depending on which is your context. Uh, as I said before, if you have your uh, team taking care about all the aspects of an application, Helm is probably uh, the solution that will suit most. You can also combine things. You can run an ELM template command in order to create an output that is a YAML file containing the right order of dependency with a different variable that has been uh, uh, populated uh, by the values set to the ELM execution. And then execute a customized command on top of the output of the ELM template command and add the additional feature. This is something that is becoming quite popular in different contexts to combine the two things, Elm and, and customize, and uh, uh, being able to take the benefit of both, the benefit of the packages of the application, the uh, conditional uh, uh, selection, and the usage of the variable, and the management of the dependency, 
with the ability to compose and merge uh, value from a customized uh, uh, command line. In the presentation, we have a series of links that are uh, available uh, for you to uh, get some additional documentation and information. The uh, uh, different links uh, uh, are often related, as in this case, to the official Kubernetes uh, documentation and uh, the Kubernetes uh, project on GitHub uh, and the blog. Uh, as I said already before, these are uh, a very important uh, source of information, uh, very detailed, up to date with the latest version every time, and a very clear and rich of example of how to do things. So this is the end of the presentation. As I said, it has been a very quick uh, move from the initial concept of what is a container, what a container is why containers are needed, why when you start using container, you will find yourself on need of an orchestrator, why Kubernetes has been selected as an orchestrator by many companies, which are the basic concept, the architecture, and the resource and element that compose the Kubernetes uh, environment. I'm uh, available online after the video for uh, Q&A. In the, uh, the beginning of the presentation, you also had my uh, contact on uh, Twitter. So feel free uh, to reach me with any question or comments. As I said in the comments of the slide, we have also reference to the uh, GitHub project where uh, you have the sample uh, of the different kind of deployments. So there is a sample of imperative and declarative kubectl, a uh, sample of deployment of a MongoDB replica set, exactly the same deployment, defined using kubectl, customize, hell, and uh, uh, Terraform. It's a sample, it's not a production-ready deployment, so, so please take care not to uh, use it for any production environment, but uh, you can uh, play with it to understand the uh, the different uh, um, option on uh, deployment. I'm putting here now on uh, the um, video also directly the link of the uh, the project in GitHub. should see it here below. So on GitHub, around the Pasquale, Kubernetes-ci.cd presentation is the uh, project I was uh, mentioning before that you can freely access to try to get uh, some sample and uh, to exercise with dif different uh, uh, method of uh, deployment. Uh, if you are interested in a specific uh, uh, case on building up a Kubernetes uh, uh, cluster, you can also refer to this other uh, banner, uh, this other uh, project that you see as a banner, Azure Kubernetes Service via Terraform, uh, that is a Terraform project that deploy uh, uh, AKS, so an Azure Kubernetes uh, service. Uh, there are two different modules, one to deploy without Azure Active Directory integrator, the integration, the other with the integration. And it does use the uh, the Terraform QCT, Kubernetes and the Terraform and provider, one to deploy the Ingress control, Nginx in this controller and the other to deploy the uh, cert manager. So the service that will take care about automated uh, creation and renewal of a certificate for your application uh, in order to see, again, also in, uh, in this case, the different uh, uh, sample and option. So I uh, thank you for your time. Uh, this has been uh, even uh, quicker than what was uh, uh, planned and expected. I've been quite quick. Apologies for my English for all the error I made during the presentation and uh, for uh, having been so fast uh, 
but I was really uh, uh, trying to save time for any uh, Q&A session that we would be able to have online. Thanks for your attention and enjoy the rest of the conference.